All right, good morning everyone and thank you so much for joining us today for this live um, virtual field trip. We are at um, the NOAA's Northwest Fisheries Science Center in um, Muckleteo, Washington State. Thank, thank you everyone for joining us. It's a little early out here. I know it's a little bit later on the East Coast. Um, this past week we have been on expedition exploring all about ocean acidification. And before we get started today, I just want to get um, clear up a couple housekeeping points of our hand for able to ask questions. Um, if you are watching our website, question form under the viewing window. Um, feel free to submit as many questions as you want on there. You guys can go ahead and start submitting now. Let us know where you're tuning in from um, and any questions that you have about ocean acidification. If you are watching on Google+, Plus, you can submit using the Q&A app. Um, that app should be right on your viewing screen. If you see another user that has the same question as you, go ahead and give that question a plus one. That way we know um, that other people have that same question. So with that being said, we are going to go ahead and get started here today. I am going to go ahead and throw to um, Philippe Cousteau. Philippe is um, the co-founder and um, president of Earth Echo International, and he is downstairs right now. So, Philippe, go ahead and take it away. Ali, everybody watching, thank you so much. We're really excited. As Ali said, we're here at the uh, NOAA Northwest Fisheries Center, uh, Science Center, and we're looking at ocean acidification, and it's a really big, big issue in the world today, and many people aren't really aware of what ocean acidification is. So that's what this morning is all about. So thank you. We have folks from all over the world joining us uh, today. We're really, really excited. And uh, and I'm joined by Paul McElhaney, here, a scientist with NOAA. And we're in one of the labs here at the NOAA Research Center, or NOAA Science Center, and uh, looking at some of the really fascinating work that they're doing here. Um, just uh, We're just north of Seattle. And, uh, and Paul, if, you know, I thought maybe a good place to start would be giving us a little bit of an overview about what ocean acidification is. Yeah, so ocean acidification happens from when CO2 gets put in the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels from burning gas and oil. About a large part of that uh, oxygen, that CO2 stays up in the atmosphere and contributes to climate change and the warming of the, the planet. But a large part of that CO2 gets absorbed by the ocean. Um, and there's so much CO2 that gets absorbed by the ocean that it causes a chemical change and makes it more acidic. Uh, that increases the acidity um, it forms a chronic acid because uh, you know when you put CO2 in soda and sort of pop and give it that bit, that also makes it more acidic. Uh, the same thing happens at a much smaller scale in the ocean. Uh, that increase in the acidity can make it really hard for some animals, uh, particularly animals that make shells to form their shells, uh, particularly things like corals. Um, Oysters, plants, yeah. shrimp, anything that makes shrimp. Yeah. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we study here in our lab. Uh, what we do is these uh, instruments right here, we kind of refer to them as the ocean time machine. You can simulate the uh, the atmosphere, uh, the oceans as they are today. And then we can add CO2 and increase the temperature and make other changes to simulate what we think the ocean is going to be like uh, in 50 years from now or 100 years from now and see how animals that we care about grow in these uh, time machines. Um, so what we do here is uh, we've got a computer control and we bubble CO2 in these tanks and then we rear them in these aquaria. Um, cool. Yeah. So the ocean time machine, I love that. And you know, for, for all of you in, in the classroom, you know, Paul, you mentioned something really important, really interesting, it, it's soda pop, so uh, Coke or whatever it may be. What you can do now, it's much more acidic than the ocean, it's, but just to get an idea, if you take a can of soda and you put a shell inside it, it will actually dissolve that shell over time. Now again, soda is much more acidic than the oceans are, but to give you a sense of what's happening on a much slower time frame in the oceans, you can do that easily in the classroom. Take a shell, put it in a soda can, and watch it over the course of days. It will start to dissolve the 
acid in that, and that carbonic acid will start to dissolve the shell. And that's really what's happening, essentially, in the oceans. Right, and that's what we do in our experiments. And you can see that if you kind of take a look at this poster right here, this is a results from one of our experiments where we did, uh, where we reared animals with kind of a current day uh, CO2 levels. Um, and then future CO2 levels when there are higher CO2 levels in the ocean. And I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but the shells on the right, you can see there are holes in it, there are breaks on both of the CO2, simulating the kind of conditions that we would expect to see in some parts of the ocean uh, by the end of the century. Well, and this is really interesting, Paul, because this is a pteropod shell. Now, a pteropod, or sometimes called the butterflies of the sea, there are three swimming ocean snail. And they're very, very important to things like salmon. Salmon feed on these and a lot of different animals, and they provide the basis of the food chain. So it's not just coral reefs and shrimp and oysters that are threatened, which is bad enough. It's a lot of these kinds of animals that are really, really, really small but still need a shell that are threatened and are the bottom of the food chain in the oceans. So when they are in trouble, it cascades through the food chain, and the oceans are in trouble, and all the, the other animals like the fish and and salmon, for example, that eat pteropods, or whales that also can eat um, a, a shell-based organism, zooplankton, et cetera, um, you know, are in trouble because their food source is disappearing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really uh, kind of disappointed. We uh, had a crew was out uh, sampling in Puget Sound yesterday, and we were hoping to have some pteropods there today because it's really amazing to watch them swim with their feet. Um, but we do have uh, kind of here. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, tell me a little bit about some of the experiments that we have going on here today. Some good ones, um, and uh, uh, what you're working on, some exciting stuff. So, what we're doing, uh, kind of what we've been working on recently, are experiments looking at uh, the larvae of Dungeness crab. Um, so, Dungeness crab, they're a really important kind of food. People, they're probably one of the top uh, sort of commercial harvests here on, on the West Coast. Um, they're also really important, as you talked about, in terms of the food web, because the larval stages, the really tiny stages, are a big part of food for things like salmon um, and other fish species. And, um, and we've got kind of here in the in this tank, I pulled these scraps off of our, oh. off of our, uh, our pier this morning. So this is a red rock crab. Uh, it's uh, related to the species that we study, which is the, the Dungeness crab. Uh, oh, sorry. So that one really wants to be back in the water. They're not very fond of being picked up. This one's a little different. Yeah, this is a, a kelp crab, which a is a kelp crab. Yeah, which is a species that we're that we're not working on at, at the idea. moment. Yeah. Oop. You got to be careful so they don't they don't pinch you. Yeah, yeah, that's important. That hurts. <laughs> and they really don't but, uh, like to be picked up. They don't like to be picked up, so I'm not going to pick them up for long. But there you can get a good close look. So this is a kelp crab, so I assume they live on kelp. Um, and or, or uh, yeah, on the bottom substrates. Even their even their feet are sharp. Ow, ow, <laughs> ow. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> um, they're beautiful. So what we study are the larval stages. We um, These crabs, they extrude their eggs, and then the female crab actually kind of holds the eggs onto her abdomen, and she holds them onto them for three months until they hatch. Then when they hatch, uh, they are um, form a larval stage, which looks not at all like the adult stage, but the larval stage, um, here's a, some pictures of some larval crab right here, those float free in the ocean, and those are the ones that are... Now, that's a larvae. That's crab larvae. So even right. though it doesn't look anything like a big crab, that will eventually turn into a crab. Right, sort of the same way that a, a caterpillar will turn into a butterfly. Butter they don't look at all the same, but um, that's what happens. So those we rear, and we reared the Dungeness crab larvae in sort of current day um, CO2 conditions and future CO2 conditions. And what we see is that they have a decreased survival uh, when you rear them in the kind of CO2 conditions that we might expect if we keep putting fossil fuels into the atmosphere at our current rate, um, the sort of levels that we might expect to see by the end of the century uh, in some places. That's not everywhere. Um, and so I don't want to, you know, kind of paint a picture that it's all blue for all the animals of the sea. Um, it's definitely it's serious. Yeah, it is serious. Um, it is definitely a serious issue, um, and, and some areas are going to be more effective than others. Well, and why this research is so important is that we still don't even understand the full impacts no, uh, at all. and the consequences of what's happening. We know they're not good. <laughs> we know they're very serious, unfortunately, and the consequence directly of our action. You know, oftentimes, ocean acidification is called 
the other carbon problem. Uh, because I want to make this very clear and remind people, ocean acidification does not come from climate change. Ocean acidification is like the sister of climate change. They have the same mother. It's carbon, right? So carbon causes ocean acidification, and excess carbon is contributing to climate change. So fundamentally, ocean acidification is another carbon problem that doesn't get a lot of attention, doesn't get a lot of press, but is, is you know, the kind of experiments that, that you're doing on, on a more basic level are possible in the classroom. I mean, really, when you, when you raise the level of, of CO2 and, and carbonic acid, then you put in things like shells, uh, they will dissolve. So it's, it's pretty easy to see with the bare eye what the consequences. And, and, it's, and it's not so bad for these big guys, right? Because right. they've already built their shells, they're big and strong. Right. It's really, the, the key is at this larval stage when they're just born and they're tiny, 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 that's when they're most vulnerable. Right, and we see that these these larval stages are kind of most vulnerable in things like the crab. It's also the same story in things like oysters. Um, it's those early stages that are kind of most critical. But as you said, they're not just economically important. They're also really, really important to the food chain and all the animals and systems in uh, in the ocean. Yeah. yeah. So um, so what else? So what else are you doing with the with, with the crabs with some of the science? We'll walk through this. Um, so yeah. So basically, what we're what we, what we do in each one of these, these systems is we um, kind of down in these bottom tanks is where we bubble different gases. So we bubble CO2 to add that into the system. We recirculate that through and then we have computers that with programs that we've written to control the concentration of everything in the, in the system. And then in these jars here, this is where we, where we hold the organisms that we're studying. This is really cool. Um, and so, you know, we'll put the crab larvae, you know, inside of it. Unfortunately, um, you know, for our uh, iPhone camera right here, the animals that we study are so small that you really can't see them with your eye. We yeah, them I, under the I, mean, I can't even, I can't see, but there, there's stuff in here. Um, not in these particular tanks at this okay. time, but um, but if there were, you could still get it. Well, I was told that uh, at its largest, that oyster larvae may look like a tiny little speck of pepper. Yeah. So, uh, so these things are really, really small. And that's like the oysters that we have at the restaurant that might, you know, be a few inches long. And they're the big oysters people eat. Uh, when they're in their larval states, they really pretty much are invisible to the naked eye. And so you'll put these larvae that you look through the microscope, make sure they're there. Then you put them into the jars. Yes. And then you have all these tubes. This really looks like kind of a vast workshop. I love it. This is really, really cool. Yeah, we have a lot of, a lot of, uh, yeah, lots of tubes. And, lots of tubes and, and, and wires and, and hoses. Right. Right, so we need to control the sea water and we need to control the, the gases. Um, and then we need to kind of measure the responses. So we look at, you know, we look at their survival. We look at how long it takes them to molt into their stages because as they, you know, they don't look at all like crabs, but, it, um, you know, if, if they're delayed and how long it takes them to molt to the next stage, um, even if it doesn't, you know, kill them outright, um, that can still affect their survival because then their timing is off. They're, they don't, they don't molt. So, Paul, I'm, I'm curious. I'd like to really quick just just recap the, the ocean acidification issue. How much have the oceans changed in the last hundred years? So, since you know, kind of the industrial revolution, when uh, people really started putting CO2 in the atmosphere, um, the, the hydrogen ion concentration, which is what we're measuring in the pH, is increased by about 30 percent, which is a substantial 30 percent. And that's a lot. Now, right. when we think about that, though, that's really just uh, the oceans are on average about a pH, what, 8.1 or so? Uh, it's sort of on average. And, and the oceans, of course, the pH scale is a logarithmic scale, right? So that's really important for everybody to remember. The oceans have changed about an 8.2. Um, yeah, it, it's in in areas. areas. Right, right. Yeah. So it doesn't seem like a lot. Right. But it can be a big difference. It can make the difference in our, in our uh, you know, experiments on the pteropods. It can make the difference between whether or not they live or die. I mean, those small changes. And those small changes, if you think about, you know, just a kind of small changes in our, our blood pH, that makes the, that can make a huge difference in that as well. So, so the oceans, the chemistry of the oceans has not been like this for millions of years. Right. And and uh, if we looked at our bodies, our, all, our bodies also need to be pH 1.8. Yeah, it's not similar, similar to the oceans, point. actually. Yeah. And um, what's interesting is that if our body's pH had changed, as much as the oceans have already changed, that 30% increase, our 
bodies would be in shock. Yeah. We would be in acidosis and in the hospital today. Um, so so that's, that, that, I think, really helps to drive home really how serious this is. Right. And, and it's going to be, uh, you know, some animals are more susceptible than other animals. Some seem um, fairly resilient to the changes in, in CO2, and some seem really, really sensitive. Some of the things that seem particularly sensitive are, are the bivalves, things like the oysters and the clams, and tropical corals also mm -hmm. seem particularly sensitive. Uh, I, I would say that the crab species that we're studying are kind of intermediate in their sensitivity. Which is good news. Yeah. But we know that the pH is going to continue to decline yeah. uh, over the next few decades because already the carbon concentrations in the atmosphere. So even if we stopped all carbon emissions today, would that stop the progression of the decline of pH in the ocean? No, there's still going to be some lag in the system, so there's going to be kind of a decrease for a while. So even though we, we can't sort of stop what's already happening and from the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere, um, we can keep it from getting worse. Um, you know, because it, 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 that doesn't mean that it, there's no value in reducing the amount of CO2 that we're seeing in the atmosphere. You don't want it to get much worse than, than it is now. And I, another question I'm curious, how do we know what historical numbers, we didn't have these kinds of labs 100 years ago, how do we know what the pH levels in the ocean were 100 years ago? Um, parent um, some, uh, we, we, didn't, right, we didn't have these kind of precise measures that we have now. We have some you know, kind of measures going back decades where people have taken these precise measurements um, in stations like off of the uh, Hawaii, where they do see that the CO2 in the ocean is So going like 40 up. or 50 years that we right. have had a precise measurement, right. we've seen a shift in right. you know, decline in the ocean. Right. Going back even further, we understand really that there are big measures of how much the CO2 is in in the atmosphere. Scientists know that from looking at CO2 measures in ice cores um, and other kind of ways that they can look at this. Coral, they can drill through, they can do coral cores as well and they can see shifts. Um, and so we know what the CO2 is like in the atmosphere. And we really have a pretty good understanding um, of how, with the CO2 in the atmosphere changes, how that changes the, the pH of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So you can reverse engineer it. Right. And so look at atmospheric concentration of CO2 and deduce what the concentration, what the pH was in the ocean at the time. Right. And you can you can look kind of even further back in time. Um, sort of uh, paleoecologists have looked back at kind of periods of time when the CO2 in the atmosphere has, has been, been higher because of volcanic activity and, and other, other events. And you can look in, and in those time periods, you don't see like the coral reefs that we have today um, just because, you know, the uh, I, I, understanding is that the pH of the ocean at those times was high enough that those reefs weren't able to persist. They couldn't create their shells. Yeah. Right? Because again, coral reefs are living animals. Uh, so I'm curious, is there anything else you want to show us in um, here? Um, no, we can head on upstairs. Okay, well we're going to head on upstairs and I will see you in just a minute. Perfect. All right. As they are coming upstairs, um, I we've gotten a few questions about audio. I think it might have been um, a little bit in and out, but I, for the most part, it sounds like almost everyone was able to hear them. I did also want to introduce, I did not introduce them when we first came on. We have Coventry High School from Akron, Ohio with us. So if you guys want to see um, and I know that they're, they are going to have some questions for Paul and Philippe once they get back up here. And we have a few questions coming in online as well. It looks like we have a lot of questions coming in um, from the Milken School. Some really great questions um, that we are going to touch on just as soon as they come up here. For those of you who just um, maybe are tuning in and aren't sure where we are, I did want to give everyone a little bit of a sense of place for you. Um, so I wanted to share with you just a Google map really quickly so that you're able to see exactly where we are on a map. Give me just one second to get this screen share going. Oh, for some reason the screen share isn't working right at this moment, but that's okay. We have um, Philippe and Paul back, so I'm going to go ahead and head over to them, and I'm going to ask them a few questions that came in from our audience.
ecosystem. So scientists have understood for a long time that the oceans were absorbing a lot of CO2 and the kind of chemical reaction of when you add CO2 to seawater that it, it makes it more acidic. Um, and kind of at first, uh, when uh, you know people were sort of understanding climate change, they were uh, there was kind of excitement that the oceans were absorbing so much of the CO2 because you know the more CO2 that's absorbed by the ocean, the less there is in the atmosphere, um, and the less there is that can contribute to climate change and, and warming. Um, but uh, kind of over the last you know kind of decade or so, scientists realized that there's so much CO2 being absorbed uh, by the ocean uh, that it would cause a big enough chemical change uh, to, to cause this effect. So uh, it's really a recent field um, of people really looking at this, but it's expanded, you know, kind of in the scientific community mm -hmm. as people realize the the issue. Um, research on it is, has really expanded rapidly. Oh, that's and so I think one of the things, speaking of sort of the research, and this um, comes from um, Dylan and Amelia at the Milken School, and they're wondering, is this affecting more than just animals that make shells? You know, how is this affecting some of those other animals? that live within the ocean. Yeah, so the pH of, of the environment can affect animals besides just uh, making their shells. So, uh, for example, um, our uh, kind of our, our best hypothesis at the moment about how uh, acidification is affecting the Dungeness crab that we're studying is not that it's affecting their shell growth, it's that the, the change in the pH is changing their internal physiology. Um, in the same way we talked earlier, if you remember, that, that pH human beings. We don't make a shell, but we do maintain a, a stable pH in our bodies, or else we have a lot of very serious problems. It's the same things for all animals, really. And, there, there, and there's been some really interesting studies looking at, at fish, which again are not making a, a shell, um, that their behavior can be really affected by the pH of their environment. It makes you, it, humans, if your pH starts to get off, you kind of act a little bit drunk, right? right. It kind of has an impact on, on your equilibrium and even human beings. So you're seeing the same thing with, with fish. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, they're, they're trying to, so it's just sort of starting to understand that mechanism. Interesting. Um, I know you have some models to show us that will yes. kind of delve into this a little bit more. Sure. I'm sorry, where is my screen now? Let me get it up on screen share. Keep these questions coming, everybody. These questions are terrific. We love it. That's really the whole point of these, these hangouts is to ask questions and get live. It's not every day you get to talk to an amazing scientist like Paul. And be so there, uh, Paul. being able to ask those questions is, is really small. So keep them coming. Yeah. Go down to, um, just go to your PowerPoint. Uh -huh. um, that's by Hangout screen. So, yeah. Oh, go down here. Yeah, mm -hmm. right there. Yeah. I'll take, take and let us here. know if you're having trouble seeing these slides. They should be up. Um, on the big screen, but just in case you're having trouble, just let us know and we'll fix that. Go ahead, Paul. Sorry. So, well, this this first slide here is just, you know, kind of recap the simplest possible slide, I think, that you can put together to describe the effect of ocean acidification of, you know, you have the uh, CO2 being put into the atmosphere and that's absorbed by the ocean, which makes them more acidic, which can affect uh, the animals. Uh, some of those behavior experiments that I, I talked about uh, a moment ago on fish have been done in, in clownfish, some of those important ones. Um, so let me, you know, kind of take a look at one of the models that we've been looking at. Um, and this one is a, uh, it's really crazy confusing. <laughs> well, that is the model. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but that's, um, that's kind of, uh, it, it's actually a simplification of the world that we live in. So this is a food web diagram of Puget Sound. So each of these boxes is a species or a group of species that lives in Puget Sound. Um, and it sort of shows starting from the, the plankton, the, the phytoplankton and the um, algae down at the bottom, mm. and kind of going up to things like sea lions and harbor seals at the top, um, kind of salmon. And it shows the connection of who we to uh, within Puget Sound. And what we do uh, are doing with this model is we're kind of asking the question. So I said before that not all animals were really equally susceptible mm -hmm. to acidification. Um, so we asked the question, um, if some of the animals that are really susceptible, like the oysters um, or the crabs or the pteropods, um, if their populations were to decline, if they were to become less abundant, how does that ripple up to the things that they eat, like the salmon and the, you know, and the, the birds and the seals? Um, so what we do is we kind of look at, at those sorts of questions. Um, and some of the 
um, you know, kind of results that we look at from that are these changes in, in this case, we're looking at things that we harvest here in the Puget Sound area, salmon and, and lingcod and shrimp and crabs. And the results, because of all that confusion in the food web, um, you can get some results that you don't expect, like some things go up mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, other things, like the crabs that we're studying, tend to go down, or, or salmon. There's a lot of uncertainty in these models, as you can imagine. Now, why would, something, why would something go up? Um, it could be that, that some of their um, predators or their preferred prey becomes more common because of competition. Um, so some things that aren't susceptible, uh, you know, are le or less susceptible, may increase abundance when their competitors um, or that are susceptible. So to let's down. say a flatfish is competing with uh, a crab for the same kind of food. There's fewer crabs. There's more food for the flatfish. So flatfish benefits in a way, but still there's a ripple through the, through the system, right? Because then the animals that feed on the crabs, well, there's not as many crabs, so they suffer, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So right. it's, it's, a, it's a complicated picture that you're trying to tease out. And just that food web that you had up earlier, I mean, if you think of eliminating just one of those boxes, you can really see how much other, how many other animals and what kind of consequences that would have in this ecosystem because of that pure debt elimination. Just say, say um, shrimp, eliminating shrimp. Look at all the lines coming out of that shrimp box and all the different animals that would then be affected. And then the animals that would be affected that eat the other animals that are affected. And it's this, you know, this like chain of, of action and uh, that has real, very real consequences. Right, and so that's we're just trying to piece together that story as best we can. And this is some sort simplified. Of yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Because each one of these boxes might have a, a large number of species in it. But I see trophic level over here. Could you explain really quick what a trophic level is? So this is a, a, a kind of a, a measure of sort of how many how many steps removed uh, in, in the food chain it is from a primary producer. Where okay, a primary, primary producer, producer. Yeah. yeah, is something that gets its energy from the sun, like a plant. Um, so, so on land it would be trees and grass, things like that. In the ocean, it's phytoplankton right. uh, and algae and seaweeds, things like that, that get their energy and photosynthesize. Right, and so, um, so they get the, so, you know, sort of the bottom trophic level are those primary producers. And then when you get up to something like, uh, like a sea lion, so you might have some small zooplankton that's gonna eat the phytoplankton and then a small fish that eats the small zooplankton, and then a larger fish that eats the small fish. And then Those are all different trophic levels, right? And then that's eventually, you know, by a by a marine mammal, uh -huh. you know, and that's like four levels up. And what we call an apex predator, or, or uh, you know, top of the food chain, essentially, like a like a sea lion or a, a whale or, or a human being. Right. Right. Yeah. So this food web doesn't include the people, and that's another, um, yeah, kind of complication in the whole in the whole thing. Um, so, you know, in thinking about this, you know, complicated food web um, issue and sort of where where people and ocean acidification play, um, you know, there are more stressors that are affecting this food web than just ocean acidification. They're also affected by pollution. They can be affected by, you know, fishing pressure. They can be affected by, um, you know, uh, you know, things that are running off into the sound um, and. So, by, if we reduce some of those other stressors, um, it's just like if you know if you have a lot of stressors put onto you, you know, just adding one more, you know, can kind of tip it over the edge. And so, you know, Paul, you bring up a great point. A lot of this is is pretty concerning. Uh, you know, ocean acidification is, is scary, and unfortunately, the oceans have changed 30 percent, and nothing we do will change them back in any time of our lifetime, certainly. Yeah. Uh, you know, the oceans and the climate do fluctuate over long periods of time. That's a natural function, but never before in any kind of record have we ever found this kind of change so rapid. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. it's, it's really human beings that, 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 despite what some people might claim, human beings that are really exacerbating making these changes much faster and much more extreme. So that's really important. You remember that, yes, chemical changes, climatological changes happen naturally, but they happen over tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, not millions of years, not over decades uh, and a century, century and a half. And um, as you pointed out, one of the things about uh, ocean acidification, though, the good news is the scientists have found 
that when ecosystems are healthy to begin with, in other words, those stressors that you talked about, like fishing and pollution, when those aren't there and the ecosystem is healthy, it's much more resilient against things like warming ocean temperatures from climate change and ocean acidification. And so that's really important to remember, folks, because these are the kinds of things that we can affect in our communities. So when you think of young people going out in your community, what can you do about ocean acidification? You can help fight overfishing, pollution, things like that. And thinking about um, uh, in human terms, for example, if as a human being you're really, really in great shape, you're eating well and you're healthy, and you get a disease, you have a pretty good chance. You know, your immune system is strong. You have a good chance of surviving that disease, right? Maybe it's tuberculosis or maybe it's cancer or something like that. However, if you're already sick, if your immune system is depressed and maybe you already have uh, a very serious illness, uh, and then you get another one and then another one and then another one, you're probably not going to survive. The environment and animals in the environment are very similar. So think of these serious diseases as, as overfishing that's putting a lot of stress and making things uh, unbalanced and, and unhealthy. And then you put in pollution, and that's another stressor, like another disease, for example, that would go into the system. And then maybe that's actually creating diseases. And then you're adding, oh, my God, the pH is changing. The water is getting warmer. You, know, you compound all of these things together, and it's typically just too much. And so the key is how do we maintain healthy ecosystems so they can be resilient in the face of things like ocean acidification. And there is evidence, as you pointed out earlier, that some systems are more resilient in the face of ocean acidification. And we certainly have found a correlation between the initial health of that ecosystem and how resilient they are in the face of, of things like ocean acidification. Do we have another question? We, we do have a question. Um, and this question, we're going to take a question from online, and then we're going to go live to our school from Ohio. So kind of going on that point, Philippe, um, the question that we have is, um, how are this comes from a woman who lives on Lake Superior, a classroom there, and they want to know how freshwater bodies um, are reacting similarly or differently in the ways that they can absorb CO2 and how acidification is affecting freshwater bodies. Great question. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting one. And we don't know um, a lot about it in some cases. Um, it, often, freshwater, um, the pH of the water is driven by things other than the atmosphere. So it's driven by the substrate over which the, you know, the fresh water is, is, is flowing, um, or it's driven by, and it's also kind of greatly influenced by terrestrial inputs, so things that wash into the, into the stream. So like pollution. Yeah. But um, the Great Lakes are kind of an interesting question um, in that, you know, it looks like they are, they are likely to you know, be some acidification effects. Um, it's not really my area of expertise, so I can't speak to it, but I know that NOAA um, has put out a report of looking at, you know, kind of proposing research to look at, um, you know, acidification lake uh, effects potential in, in the Great Lakes. Um, so I think that, that that's really, a, you know, a, 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 a not very well known story. Which is exciting. I mean, part of this, you know, big part of the ocean acidification story, is um, is that we don't know, uh, you know, what is going on in some cases, and we certainly don't know enough. And so it's a real great opportunity, not only for scientists like you, Paul, but we were with students, and that's all part of our FECO expeditions that we'll be launching in February. We were with students yesterday that are actually working and doing pH testing in, in local water systems around them that is contributing to the science. So students can get involved. And the World Water Monitoring Challenge also allows you to test pH. And we're partnering with groups like XPRIZE to also develop and work with them on some of the pH monitors that they're developing. So as students in classrooms around the world, you can get these kinds of monitors and you can upload and contribute to the scientific data out there. And what's really, really important is to do that frequently. We always tell students that what we try and get is, is and what you're trying to do is, you don't just put a sensor in the water, test it once. You're putting a sensor in the water to test it over time, because pH can fluctuate during the day. It can fluctuate uh, uh, during the year with different temperatures. So cold water holds that CO2 better than warm water, for example. Um, like if you look at uh, Coca-Cola, for example. If you have a or soda, any soda, it's nice and cold, and you open the lid, and it, uh, you get a little bit of gas that comes out, but not a lot. Whereas if that, that soda's been sitting in the sun, it's really hot, you open the lid, and it fizzes a lot. That's essentially what's happening, right? The cold water holds the CO2 better 
than warm water. So you're also seeing changes in pH a little bit more drastically in places like here in the northern latitudes, it's a little bit colder than in some areas that are warmer. Yeah, and that's that actually kind of brings up the kind of the next image that I wanted to show that some of the work that we're doing trying to understand the pH in Puget Sound. Um, this is a, a, a model of the pH in Puget Sound, and it's really kind of hard to maybe orient yourself, but we are about right here, oh, up here, I guess, on the on this map, um, and it's showing the depth of the water and the changes in pH over time. So you can see that it, it it's variable. I mean, there's a you know some places like this is a good canal um, where pH is really quite low. So that means that there's you know it's, it's already quite acidic. So that's one thing about here in the Pacific Northwest is naturally our water is more acidic than in other places of the ocean. So the concern is that you add more CO2 from the atmosphere, um, and that could kind of tip this area um, over the edge sooner than in. Other now I want to remind everybody, you're looking at the color diagram here, it's 8.1 at the top is red, and as it goes down, um, uh, uh, it's becoming more acidic. Right, right, and so these, these deep areas in Puget Sound are, are really quite acidic, and then there are other areas that are, that are less acidic, um, up near the surface um, in some of the other bays. So what we're trying to do in, in terms of understanding how this is going to affect the animals is we take a, a model like that where we're looking at what the pH is in the sound, and we um, and we simulate the movement of zooplankton through that environment. So this is a, a map again of, of Puget Sound, um, and what we do is we simulate the movement of individual zooplankton through that sound, and um, you'll see them sort of start to move. They don't move nearly that fast, uh, so we speed this up a lot. Uh, but you can see how they're kind of pushed around by the currents as they move. And what we can do when we simulate their movement through Puget Sound is we can then, um, you know, kind of measure in our model uh, what their pH exposure is over time. So we can see, you know, kind of the patterns of which so they're supposed to see. So it's just 7.6. That's 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 quite low. That's quite low. Right. Um, so here, naturally, we can ha we have uh, some, yeah, some very low um, pH conditions currently. Uh, and uh, that can, and so, uh, you know, in some places in Puget Sound, conditions are already low enough uh, that they would affect things like the dissolution of terrified shells. So there are some places where that's already uh, currently an issue. Um, and the concern is that, that the area where that is a starting to yeah, will expand. You know, and some of the models that I've seen project that, you know, kind of by the end of the century, sort of all of Puget Sound will be um, in that range where um, pteropods uh, tend to dissolve. We're going to take a question um, from Coventry High School, actually. So I am going. Hello? We can hear you. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, is there any way that we could dilute the acid in the water? <laughs> you guys are muted. We are muted. Now we're not. There we go. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so people have, have uh, the amount of CO2 that's putting put it into the atmosphere and the size of the ocean is so huge that it's really not practical to do something like um, uh, to, to, you know, somebody said, you know, add a, like, a, a, you know, many, many bottles of Tums to the ocean <laughs> because it's, you know, the, it's the same problem, you know, in, when your stomach gets uh, too acidic, you take some, you know, Tums, which is calcium carbonate, which is, uh, tends to neutralize the acid uh, in your stomach. Um, the quantity um, that would be required to be do a lot something of like that would not be practical. Um, so, uh, so, so, so geoengineering is what it's right, called. Right. In, in this case, it's, it's probably right. a right. unlikely solution. At the scale of the entire ocean, people have looked at doing that in terms of kind of small bays, like small bays in, in Puget Sound. There might be ways that you could um, kind of affect the, the local pH. Um, mainly, people have looked at that by growing kelp. Yes. Because kelp. Um, as a, or any kind of primary producer, anything that's, any plant, yeah, right. that's photosynthesizing, they pull CO2 to make food for themselves. They take CO2 and they turn it into sugar and release oxygen. Uh, 
So if if you have uh, in in a small bay, if you had you know say a, a kelp farm where you would have the kelp sort of pull the CO2 out of the water, then you could harvest the kelp, eat the kelp, I and mean, that would sort of remove CO2 from that local bay. You know, as long as there wasn't too much exchange. But that's really kind of only practical in a small, you know, enclosed space. And no one has sort of um, demonstrated that that it can work. So, but people are, are um, here in Puget Sound are setting up to do experiments to see if that can that can. We were visiting some of those folks actually oh, uh, right. a couple days right, ago, right. and what's really interesting is that you know, and this is where the innovation and ingenuity comes in, right? And this is the kind of innovation that all of you can participate in. Because what the scientists and, and local businesses and NGOs are looking at is that people also consume kelp. It's used in a lot of cosmetic products uh, and a lot of food products. And so if they could actually plant kelp and increase the kelp populations here in Puget Sound, would that help to reduce CO2 levels and, and help mitigate pH changes and then also be something that would make people money? It could be an industry that could be a sustainable industry that could uh, create economic growth in the region as well. So really some interesting and exciting opportunities in that respect to try and do something on a localized scale. But yeah. ocean-wide, really, yeah. really... Uh, right. there aren't, yeah, there aren't kind of engineering kind of solutions to that. And um, any other questions? Yeah, so, and that kind of leads into another question that we had um, from some students that are wondering, you know, is it possible to to lead organisms to a health to a healthier ecosystem, you know that was something that came in from a school in this local area. Can you lead them out of um, more acidic areas into less acidic areas? Or is that just not possible? Um, well, the, the, you know, they, they're all, you know many of the organisms are you know are in the ocean are like the plankton that we're studying. You know, they move around mm -hmm. a lot, and they'll they'll find a habitat that will that will work for them. They'll kind of do it themselves. So they'll kind of do it themselves. Human beings right. to lead them, but right. Um, and we already see, you know, that kind of shift in the distribution of where the animals are from climate change. Um, you know, we see, you know, some things like corals, you know, ten tending to, to move from some of the tropical areas, kind of moving further north. Um, you know, the, one of the kind of the challenges when you deal with these multiple stressors is that they, the, the ideal habitat can kind of compete. So you can imagine sort of warming things would might tend to tor move further north. Um, but from the north is where some of these acidification effects. So you're talking about stronger. warming oceans from climate change. So that's one thing. So animals are starting to move north to get back to colder water. But as we talked about earlier, colder water has has absorbed more CO2 and has more pH changes. So you're kind of bringing animals, maybe squeezing them out, and they're coming into conflict from the north and south of two different types of stressors. Right. But but it, yeah. But animals, you know, if they're able to move, I mean, there's some animals that are. That are kind of sessile and they're stuck in place. Yeah. I mean, it's not really an option yeah. uh, for them. Um, and then we had another question that came in earlier while you were in the lab, and they wanted to know where you get um, your your zooplankton larvae. Are you breeding them here? Are you are, are they wild caught? How is that happening? We're um, we're getting uh, wild caught from mm -hmm. here in Puget Sound. So things like the Dungeness crab, we'll collect the females. Uh, before they extrude their eggs or while they have eggs. And then we'll hatch those uh, eggs here in the lab and then we'll do our experiments on them. Uh, some of the animals that we study, like the pteropods, uh, we'll catch them in nets from Puget Sound. So we'll go out um, at night, usually because they, uh, that's the best time to catch them because during the day they go down to deep water so that they can hide from all the fish um, so that they don't get eaten uh, in the daylight and then they come up at night to feed. Um, and so that that's usually when we go up, out to try to catch them. It's a fun um, job as a scientist, um, right? Yeah. Go crabbing. Yeah. <laughs> Very fun. And then we have one um, one question that has come in multiple times. We're sort of running short on time here, but we've seen this question a lot, and this is something that you know we at Earth Echo are always bringing up: is what can people do in their own local communities to make a difference with ocean acidification? You know, how can we help now? What can we do? Yeah. Well, I, I think, well, obviously, since the root driver is um, CO2 in the atmosphere, anything that kind of contributes to reducing CO2 kind of in the atmosphere in terms of what, you know, people, the choices that people make as, as individuals um, and the choices that they make, um, you know, in terms of as a, you know, sort of interaction with government and, um, um, you know, that, that's, you know, kind of a, you know, an obvious place to start. Uh, but also, um, you know, ways in dealing with kind of the multiple stressors. 
so the you know we can think about that in terms of uh, you know the consumption that we make uh, in terms of uh, seafood. Um, so if you know one of the stressors that can affect things are uh, is over harvest. Um, you know, just making sure that we're focusing on uh, eating seafood that's sort of sustainably harvested, um, and that's kind of a choice that individuals can make. Um, if you, you know, kind of are near, live near the coast, um, you know, thinking about um, things that can contribute to runoff, because, you know, things that run off into the ocean, and ultimately everything ends up running off into the ocean, uh, but things that run off into the ocean, um, uh, you know, that can affect kind of local pollution levels. So so local runoff. Here's, here's I wanted to show you all a Seafood Watch app that you can download onto your phone on Apple or Android. Uh, is, a, is a great choice that you break out at restaurants when you're ordering seafood to see what's sustainable seafood and what isn't. Um, so there are some really great tools that allow you to do that. And then, of course, as you mentioned, who you vote for and influencing and helping to, you know, who your parents vote for. Uh, energy efficiency is another big one that helps cut uh, carbon. And when we think about food, you know, my wife and I live in an apartment and we still compost because that's a really good way to create your own soil and capture that carbon back in the soil as opposed to dumping it into landfills and growing your own food. Uh, doing things like, uh, you know, how you drive. We have an electric car, so embracing new innovative technologies. Uh, solar, solar power, solar panels on your roof. Uh, um, if any of you are in Florida, there's a big campaign, Floridians for Solar Choice, right now. You can check that out on, uh, on my Facebook page at Philippe Gusto. I post about it a lot. And they're looking to change the law in Florida so that people can buy and sell energy. Into the panel, sun anywhere. So there's legislative things that we can do. Um, you know, there's personal behavior. Cutting back on pollution uh, is really, really important. Uh, and carbon. And, and who we vote for, and that's really important. So there's lots of different things that we can do. Yeah, and um, I just wanted to say, before we sign off for today, thank you so much, Paul, for having us here today um, and showing us around your lab. I know it's um, your lab space is kind of tight, so it's not possible to take an actual field trip. Yeah. Um, so these virtual <laughs> field trips are pretty nice. Great, yeah. And um, I... Also on social media, we are out in the field on Expedition right now, so you can follow along um, on our Instagram, our Facebook, um, our hashtag is hashtag Expedition EE, um, and you can always email us with any questions that you have. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I've been posting a lot of fun pictures at the Pete Cousteau on Instagram and, and Twitter and Earth Echo as well, and I just want to also take a minute. This wouldn't be possible without some really wonderful people like Paul and the terrific work that Noah does uh, and and I and I want to say the, the scientists all over the country and the world that work with NOAA doing this work and I also want to thank our sponsors uh, uh, Campbell Foundation Honda Foundation Southwest Airlines uh, and of course North Face that is always outfitting us on all our expeditions keeping us warm and dry uh, you know our, our, our sponsors may really make this possible too and we're so thrilled that all of you so many of you participated thousands of you today have participated in this in this hangout I hope you enjoyed it it will be archived and of course, you can contact us if you have some more follow-up and more questions, and we'll do everything can, everything we can to uh, to answer them. So, Paul, thanks again. Man. Really, yeah. really terrific thanks time. And uh, and thank you all for joining. Thank you.